Hey, Effort at Community Church. It is so good to be a part of your weekend. And we do refer to you as Effort at Community Church wherever you're at now, whether you're sitting in York County, Berks County, maybe at Myrtle Beach. Who knows where you might be right now? We want to recognize you as part of us. And in order to bring you fully up to speed with what's going on today, I want you to get prepped for a kind of unusual ending. Kevin's going to be continuing our series on the Holy Spirit this week. And uh, I have to tell you, it's one of the, my favorite times I've ever heard him share on it, just his own journey journey alongside the Holy Spirit and also just encouraging us to step into what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. So we end up with a time at the end where we're going to be praying for a deeper move of the Spirit, another baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life. So we ask you to be prepared. Kevin is actually part of the end of his message. We just ask you to sit there and receive. We believe the Holy Spirit If the Spirit can use a donkey to speak in the Old Testament, surely He can use the internet. We honestly believe that wherever you're sitting, that you're going to experience a blessing of the Lord today. And so we encourage you to be ready for that at the end. Also, I want to bring you up to speed on a few dates, man. Kids Camp's about to launch 391 kids, 180 volunteers. Man, you should see the yard right now. We have three tents. It's bigger than any circus I've ever seen out there. It's going to be a circus unto Jesus. It's going to be great. Please be praying for our youth this week. I also want to remind you of some upcoming dates. Baptism's happening second weekend in July. Feel free to consider taking part of that. Also, we talk a lot about Connections Pathway, what it means to learn more about our community. It's the second Saturday morning of every month. So I think it's July 13th. Yeah. Yeah, July 13th this week, this month. Would you consider coming out and spending a morning with us and talking a little bit about what it might be to to take a step even closer to us as a community? We'd appreciate having you also on July 15th We're going to be holding a political discussion engagement forum. Kevin himself is going to lead that. If you're interested, you can come and be a part of it here at the church. You can read more about it online. It's all there for you to check out. Now, also this week, we're introducing our Esther reading guide. It's for our summer reading. This document will be online this week. Feel free to check it out. And then you're able to continue with us throughout the summer as we look at the book of Esther. We'll be starting that in two weeks. So if you get a chance, take the time to download that and we'd love to have it in your hands for this week. Again, we appreciate you. I'll be back to talk to you a bit at the end. Take care. It is our desire to connect you with God and others. Our time together is about to begin, so please make your way into the auditorium. If it's your first time here, you can visit one of our welcome centers where you receive a gift and find other helpful resources. We would like to hear from each of you every time you're here, so please fill out a Connect card either in person or online via the ECC app. Let us know how we can pray for you, provide you with care, or join in your celebration. There are multiple opportunities for you to support the ministry of ECC, including giving. You can do this online via our website through the ECC app, by texting your donation amount to 84321 or by dropping a giving envelope into one of the designated boxes in the auditorium doorways. Stay up to date with all the exciting events happening at ECC throughout the year by signing up to receive our weekly e-news, which is sent out every Thursday. Simply check the appropriate box on your Connect card or subscribe through the website, effortacommunity.church. We believe that the journey with Jesus is taken in steps and encourage you to find your best next step walking with Him. If you're new to the community, visit the First Steps Room, which is located on the right-hand side of the auditorium's lower level. One of our pastors will be there to help you discover more about who we are as a church. The Next Steps Room is located in the lower lobby, directly outside the auditorium. We have people from different ministries there every week, So stop by to learn about the discipleship opportunities we offer and various ways in which you can get more involved in our community. We invite you to join us now in lifting up the name of Jesus, hearing wisdom from God's word, and receiving from his spirit what he knows you need today.
Good morning, Ephrata Community Church. Hey, can I invite you to stand to your feet? We're going to worship the Lord this morning. I want to read from Isaiah 44. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, my servant, upright one whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Are you excited to worship the Lord together this morning with an expectation? Yeah, come Holy Spirit, let's worship together.
Captain's boat When you breathe the dead around And your bones come back to life There is power in this room Where the Spirit of the Lord is Bye.
then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And they were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. You're going to join them? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Everyone with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. One more time.
just agree with your word that your praises would be on the lips of every generation. God, every generation that ever has been or ever will be, God, on their lips, you deserve all praise, all glory, all honor belongs to you. In Jesus' name. Hey, I want to dismiss our children. Um, they can be dismissed to their ministry areas. And can we just turn and bless them as they go. Father, we bless our children in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we think of even kids camp this weekend. 391 kids uh, are going to descend on this property. God, and we bless them with an encounter with your presence and with your person, with to be full of your spirit. We bless them in Jesus' name. Father, we think of what they're going to be taught even this morning in their classrooms. God, we bless them to have ears to understand the message of the gospel, to encounter your presence, and to develop life-giving community in each and every classroom. God, we bless them in the mighty name of Jesus, and we thank you for each and every one of them. In Jesus' name.
gods and the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Is it not? Amen. Hey, you can go ahead and take your seat. While you're doing that, I, I just want to highlight again, uh, this week we have 391 kids who are going to be on campus, 187 people who are going to serve them. Last year there were 46 salvations. We're expecting more this year. Would you join with me this week in praying for more? And not just simply like tossing up a prayer if you think about it, but actually interceding. One of the things that we know uh, that God has done and is doing is we believe we have a word about our children here at Ephrata Community Church, and that is because we honor the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of our kids, we believe that God's going to do a move of his Holy Spirit through our children. And we've seen that before. We've seen our kids take the lead in teaching us on how to pray for people and how to share the gospel. And this week, they're together studying Galatians chapter 5 and the fruit, the evidence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And what if our children led us into the fullness of joy in the Holy Spirit, the fullness of love, of peace? What if our children led us into the fullness of self-control in the Holy Spirit? See, I think the Holy Spirit might want to do some things uh, through our children as it affects the whole life of the church and the community. So would you join with me this week in actually a faith-filled expectant expectation that God is going to move and his spirit is going to move through our children. Uh, so let's do that and keep uh, all the people uh, in your prayers who are serving as well. Hey, let me uh, uh, say good morning and welcome. It's nice to see all your smiling faces. It's a reminder to, small, uh, to smile. Thank you. For those of you who are visiting with us uh, today, we want to extend a special invitation to you. We're glad that you decided to come out and worship with us today. And you'll notice in the seat back pocket in front of you, there is a connect card. If you are visiting with us today, we invite you to pull that out, put your name on it, and hold on to that until the service comes to a close. And one of our pastors will be to my left in our first steps room to take that information from you and greet you and is there to answer any questions that you may have. I also want to take a minute and turn to those watching with us this morning on live stream. We've been praying for you and have an expectation that you as well are going to encounter the person and the presence of our Lord and Savior. So welcome in that way also. For those of you who are not visiting, who are regular among us, I don't have to remind you to let us know that you're here on that connect card. You can put any prayer requests you have and to make sure you drop those off in the receptacles at the end of the service as you leave the auditorium this morning. Hey, you guys ready for a little bit of family news? Yeah? That, that was, that was half-hearted. But you better get ready because this is pretty awesome. We want to say a big congratulations to Douglas and Patricia Mims on their 70th anniversary. <laughs> Sitting right in the front row here. Come on, 70 years. <laughs> Kevin, I have officially lost control of this service. <laughs> That's incredible. We honor you and we bless you as you celebrate 70 years together. Hey, I bet you there are a ton of stories in that 70 years. And actually, if you think back to earlier this year when we were in the God Is series, um, one of the most regular pieces of feedback we as pastors got was how, how you enjoyed hearing the stories of, how, of the pastors who were sharing and how that connected with an attribute or a characteristic of God. And uh, now it's your turn. You will have noticed in the e-news, right at the top, there is a share your story link. And you would have heard before that we're collecting testimonies for a celebrating 50 years of God's faithfulness kind of testimony book. Uh, and we would love to hear from you in that way. So you can follow that link right in the e-news. It'll take you to a place where you can put a little bit of your story. Or if you're like me, you can just click a box and say, hey, I'd like someone to interview me a little bit and help me and just allow me to verbally share my story. Because we want to hear from you on testimonies of God's faithfulness. We're going to put it together. We're going to publish it, and we're going to celebrate together uh, the work that God just continues to do in the life of his people and his church in that way. So we'd love to hear you, um, hear from you for those testimonies in that way. Hey, speaking of testimonies, I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to the screen behind me. Ella is going to share an incredible testimony, and then Pastor Kevin is going to be up sharing with us from the word this morning. 
I came to Lancaster 2010, started working for Hershey Farm 2011. At the time as a manager, I started going to his Bible studies, which is Foundry. I did that for 12 years, three times a week. And during these Bible studies, I would attend the Bible studies. I was the reader most of the time. I began to build a relationship. I had plenty of time. I had plenty of time to spend time with God and to read the Bible. Claire <laughs> Zeger, who uh, also invited me to his office and asked me if I wanted to talk and he'll go over the scripture and explain it to me. Um, this happened for a while. I would read the scripture and I'll come back and I'll be like Kramer and Seinfeld. I'll be like, <laughs> Claire, you know, <laughs> is this what it says? You know, you know, you, you know, tell me what it says. You know, am I seeing it the right way? He'll say, yeah. First thing, I fell in, I, I, what really got my attention is how he loved me. It was the love. It was how he died on the cross with me. All my life I've been looking for love and looking to be accepted. It's like my, he gave me another mindset and he renews your heart. Romans 12 too, I study that. I believe in his love and I know he loved me and I know he did this for me. I know he sacrificed himself for me. I have faith. Oh, we got baptized over at Claire House. All of us did, right? That's what you mean? Like, yes, all of us did. The whole family and uh, it was awesome. I believe I was different after that. I just believe I felt different in the inside after that. Jesus' love gives you a joy and acceptance. You can sit with yourself and be in joy. You don't need the world to say, man, you're great, you're good. I walk with my head up high now. I didn't do that before. You know, I got my little stuff on, so cut girl and stuff like that. <laughs> so this is a whole new world to me, and I'm having a ball. It is. Dude, it's like reborn. I'm reborn. <laughs> I just need to say it is very unfair <clears throat> for me to have to sit and listen to that testimony now for the fourth time and have to get up here and speak after that. Man, I just need, I just need recovery moment here. Just everybody, let's, let's just recover for a moment. Okay, I'm not going to recover. Just move on. I just, just not gonna, man, what an amazing story. And uh, man, thank you, Ella. Thank you, Claire. You know, if you've got just the whole story there as well. You know, of course, her being born, born again and uh, being reborn, not just because it says so in a book, but because she experienced that and the difference that it made in her life. And I think of, you know, one time she's sitting there with Kleenexes in her hands, the next time she can't stop laughing. And it just speaks of the very personal nature of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in her life. And then Claire, Claire Zeger, who she mentions in that testimony, he's an employer, Hershey Farms Restaurant, and uh, he took, you know, some of the things that he had in the Bible study, took it and offered it to the employees there at Hershey Farm Restaurant. You can see a transformation that's occurred as he made himself available, even as an employer, to those that he serves in that way. Man, what a, what a great, great story. Man, it just reminds us that what we do here is not confined to here. It has to go outside. We practice, we learn, we're equipped, but man, it has to go far, far beyond here. Man, what an awesome story. Hey, um, you'll notice when you came in today, you might have noticed this in your worship guide. Um, if you didn't, oftentimes you pick up maybe one worship guide per family or so, but make sure you have more of that than these. Uh, every year for the past 10 years, we take a certain part of our year and we do a reading series. So we get into the book of a, a book of the Bible. Uh, last year was the Gospel of John. The year before it was the book of Revelation. The year before that it was uh, Jonah from the Old Testament. <clears throat> and we do that for a couple of reasons. A couple of times a year, we just give you some sort of tool to help either build habits, build good habits into your life, or to actually reaffirm some of the habits that are there. And so the first and most primary purpose of a reading guide or our book study is to get you in the Word, you yourself interacting with the Word of God. <clears throat> And so we just simply want to encourage you in that. Uh, this year we're doing the book of Esther. So a couple things about this. You'll open this up and you'll see uh, two, two reading guides. One here on the top is this. This is if you want to read during the eight weeks that we're going to spend in the book of Esther. If you want to read through that one time, uh, this is the guide you would follow. But come on. It's ten chapters. 
That's tough it up here a little bit. Just kidding, but just giving you the option if you want the two or three verses per day. That's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that to some degree. But anyhow, down here at the bottom is, is if you want to read through the book of Esther every week, which is very, very doable for the eight weeks that we're together. And what happens when you read through that book just with that kind of repetition? It really becomes part. Like it, it actually, like there's an impartation to you. It becomes part of who you are, not just simply a story that you read. Now, we'll introduce the rest of what we're going to be doing during that eight weeks a little bit later on as well. But I would also just open this up briefly. And what we're doing here is we're giving you some morning and evening exercises. Uh, first and final 15, as you wake up in the morning, committing your day to the Lord. And then some reflection time as your, as your day comes to a close. And here's the reason why we're doing that. Here's a goal uh, and there's a reason why we have chosen the book of Esther. So as Chris mentioned earlier this year, we had a... It would technically be called a sermon series on the attributes of God. We called it the God Is series. And basically what we did was we took a biblical foundation, but then we also shared personal stories about those climactic moments in which God revealed himself to us as well. And so it was very much like God revealed himself in a very significant way, and climactic is a great way, life-defining moments. And so we had a whole series from January, February, March into Easter that focused on the way God reveals himself to, that, uh, to us in that way. But the bottom line is, when you think about your life and those climactic moments, defining moments, and the way in which the Lord intervenes in that way, honestly, over the span of a lifetime, you might have like five of those. Maybe ten. I mean, maybe, you know, I don't know, but it isn't like that's a regular thing. But here's the thing. Jesus said that uh, when he was on earth, he made a statement, my father is always at work. Always, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So what's that tell us? That means that most of the time when God is at work, we're missing it. We're just not noticing it. And so we've chosen the book of Esther as a, a reading series. You would call it, it's the opposite or it's the other side of the coin, not the opposite. But it would be the God Ed series is one side of the coin. The Esther series is the other side of the same coin. God is always at work. Sometimes it's climactic. And sometimes it's just we don't notice it. It's always there, and we have to be alert to it. So our desire in that is that we want to increase in God awareness. We want to see him every day. So we're going to posture ourselves in the beginning of the day. Lord, I just want to, I want to be alert to your work around me. And then at the end of the day, we want, to, we want to reflect on that. And so we're going to come to the place where we know it more. So a couple other sideways goals or sec secondary goals. I want to eliminate from our language things like it just so happened. I'm coming to an intersection, it's a T road, and uh, I look both ways, I have a stop sign, so I look both ways, it seems clear, I'm pulling my foot off the brake and ready to go on the gas, and I just so happen to look back and notice someone coming that I'd missed before. You didn't just so happen. The Lord was at work saving you from a disaster that would be both financial and possibly physical and maybe even beyond that, right? And we want to eliminate the whole idea of, hey, coincident coincidentally, I just ran into somebody and we had a conversation. Like, that kind of way that we talk as if it's all kind of random around us. Like, we're just going to, we're going to wipe that from our way of thinking because we're going to recognize the ways of God every single day of our life in ways that we just oftentimes overlook. Or we, we don't honor him just simply by recognizing his activity in our life. So that's going to be part of what we're going to do. That's going to be coming up here in a couple of weeks. And I'm really looking forward to that. This week, of course, kids camp. You saw the whole building set up and what's going on out in the parking lot, which just simply tells us that kids camp is going to be intense. <clears throat> and it will be. Uh, it's June, so you've got to have a remnant of a dad joke in there someplace as well. But here, for us today, we are finishing up this series on the work of the Holy Spirit this weekend, next weekend. And I would just simply say this. We've been in this for eight weeks. And I would just want to recognize today, even as the same topic this week and next week, that uh, I feel like this eight weeks in the work of the Holy Spirit has been uh, deficient into communicating all of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit and who he is. And so even as we come to the last couple of weeks of the work of the Holy Spirit, I would ask you to make, to keep what we've shared with you, which we, I feel, we feel that we've been obedient to what the Lord has for us, to keep that in the context of everything that is after the community church. For example, I'll tell you this. Did you notice that there wasn't a one single weekend that we focused on the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Who would possibly ever do an eight-week series on the work of the Holy Spirit and not include the gifts of the Holy Spirit? 
And so what I mean by within the context of who we are, recognize that not everything that we do happens in a weekend service. And so you can think about the spiritual gifts intensive of the Harvest Net School of Ministry, where you both dig in to learn as well as activate those gifts inside of you. And, and uh, we have growth groups specifically on the spiritual gift of prophecy. And so take everything that we've shared with you, even as we emphasize in obedience to the Lord the things that he had for us, recognize that there's actually more to it. So to kind of cover a couple of bases, let me just make some blanket statements about the work of the Holy Spirit in case maybe you're new with us and you've not heard that before. So let me just kind of make a couple statements here. One is all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are active today. And I simply make that statement just simply because we recognize that there's different streams in the body of Christ and teach some things differently. We carry respect for all of that. Our understanding both from Scripture as well as the historical evidence that, that backs up what Scripture says, all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are active today and, and available to us to advance the kingdom. So all of them, all of them were, are there. Secondly, that's not, I don't think that's too controversial, but this one might, well, I will just say it and see. <laughs> um, you have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You have all of them. Because it's not just about a gift, it's actually about the person of the Holy Spirit. And so when you're receiving the Holy Spirit, you're actually receiving all of the gifts. And I realize that there's some that may, you may develop in or may, you may lean towards or you may work in more. But we shouldn't limit ourselves even by our own experience. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, he's actually able to release or activate gifts in different circumstances. So you may say, I've never received the word of knowledge. It doesn't mean that you will never receive a word of knowledge. Like you can activate that gift and you can pursue God for it. It may be that you've never prayed for someone that was healed. That there's no working of miracles. It doesn't mean that you will never see that. So never limit yourself based upon past experience. And there's times in which you can both learn about a gift and then see that gift activated in your life and experience something that you've never experienced before at all. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Great three chapters, all of which is about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14, I believe it's verse 1 says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Pursue them. In other words, be active. Don't, like, just be passive and say, well, we'll see what happens to turn up. No, actually, pursue. Say, I want to have a word of knowledge. Never had one, but I want one. I want to, I want to be able to minister to people in that way. Like, just see those things released in you. So a couple of blanket statements there as well. We've called this series uh, Inward Fire, which we're talking about the inner working of the Holy Spirit to create um, Christ-likeness in us, to set us free from those things of the past. And even as we reflect over these past number of weeks, we spent a lot of time with that, which I think is what the Lord was revealing to us. But then also outward fire, like the outward light, the, the ministry that comes actually through that as well. And uh, the work of the Holy Spirit can be somewhat mystical to some degree, and that's logical. Or it could be... Uh, for those watching online outside of the area, you would call it spooky, but if you live locally, it's spooky. <laughs> so, depending on where you live, it's, you know, so especially like if uh, uh, you, you think we can relate to God as a father that makes sense to us, he's a creator, we can relate to Jesus, especially because he, he walked as a human being, was weary like we are, like all of that. But then the Holy Spirit just seems a bit like it's hard for us to grasp, which makes sense. And depending on the tradition that you grew up in, he may have been called Holy Ghost, which even, that doesn't help, right? It doesn't, like the Holy Ghost, and especially, you know, in a Pentecostal, you hear those people, the Pentecostal preachers that just say Holy Ghost in a very unique way. That just really, like, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound like it's real comforting to be. I'd always call it the comfortable, but that's not, whatever that is. So, so we, we have this history that is there, and I understand all of that, but it's really much more simple than that. And the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. And the New Testament word for spirit is pneuma. And it literally refers to the, actually the wind, the, like the breath in your lungs. Like it's the breath of life. And there's even sometimes in the Old Testament where it literally is translated, it's the breath of life. And it's like that idea, you know, if you ever heard the saying, like, just get some wind in your sails. And just the way that, man, the sails are up and so forth, and, but there's no wind, there's no motivation. And so you're working, you're rowing at those oars and so forth, and all of a sudden the breeze comes along and it catches the wind and the sails open up. And all of a sudden there's motivation, even, even with, like, you're not doing all the work. You're in cooperation with it, but the wind is doing the work. And that's a little bit of a picture of, 
of the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the wind in your sails. He's the wind in your sails. And that little phrase there that I talked about, like he's the wind in your sails, or, um, that actually comes from a maritime, it's a saying that comes out of a maritime uh, statement or word or experience called the doldrums. So, you know, you probably think if you look up the word doldrums in the Webster's Dictionary, you'll find I think it's three different uh, definitions for the word doldrum. And the first one is it speaks about us when we go through seasons of life where we feel despondent, maybe depressed, maybe um, listless, like you just, like uh, there's no motivation, you know, putting one foot in front of the other, but I'm just not, I'm just actually just not getting anywhere. And so it's like you're going through a season of the doldrums personally. Then the third definition in Webster speaks of, you know, almost like a slump that you go through. It could be a baseball team gets a slump. You know, so even though they have all the skill, they are a team, they, all, they just go through this season where they just lose. Or just they're in a slump that they can't break out of, and sometimes called the doldrums. But then when that word is used with an uppercase D at the beginning, it's actually a noun, and it speaks of a place. And it speaks of a place near the equator in the ocean where the northern hemisphere winds and the southern hemisphere winds who are operating in a different direction. Am I doing that? Like in what? So yeah, you, get to, you get the point. Um, so the northern hemisphere is turning one way, the southern hemisphere is turning the other way, and there's actually a place where it comes together where they cancel one another out. So you can be in the middle of the ocean and the water completely calm, smooth as glass. No wind whatsoever. Now in this day and age, it doesn't really make any difference because most ships that cross the ocean, they have some sort of power, you know, uh, diesel or whatever. They got some sort of power to power through that. But can you imagine 150, 200 years ago or longer where it was just simply like you're relying upon the wind and you either get off course or something like that and you get, you drift into that place that's known as the doldrums. And you're out in the middle of the ocean near the equator. So you can imagine how hot it is and the sun is beating down and you're lost, like you're stuck. There's nothing that you can do to get you out of this situation. The sea is calm. There's no waves to push you along. There's no wind. And so even though they had the sails up and they could catch the wind if there was any, can you imagine like coming up and, and looking up in the hot beating sun? You're running out of supplies. The water's running. And you're like, I'm going to die here. And you're looking up these sails that are up and they're just flat. Like there's nothing there at all. And then one day, man, just the relief that comes when you wake up and you, you, hear, you hear the wind come. And the sails just open up. They catch the wind. And if you think, if you can think about an old ship that would be made out of wood, that would have a wooden mast and so forth. And, and just like you can hear the wood creaking as the, it catches the wind and all of a sudden you're propelled forward. That's the picture of the Holy Spirit. Where you're not really doing anything different. You just kind of welcome, you put your sails up and you welcome the Holy Spirit. And he just simply empowers and it's refreshing. Can you imagine how refreshing that would be to be stuck in the middle of the ocean. All of a sudden the wind comes and just propels you forward. Man, that's just an awesome picture. I'm going to ask you to go to your message notes. <clears throat> and I titled today's message, There's More Than One. So if you ask questions of the message, your question may be for today, more than one what? And the answer to that question is, there's more than one baptism. And actually, I would go as far as to say there's four, record, there's four baptisms recorded in the New Testament. Let me go through these relatively quickly here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse, I'm sorry, chapter 12 verse 13 is one of the ways, one of the places where it speaks of the baptism. Remember, baptism means to be immersed. You're, you're actually fully immersed into something. That speaks of the baptism into the body of Christ. So here it says, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So what's interesting about that is your decision to follow Jesus is your decision. Like it's up to you. It's between you and the Lord. And we oftentimes say that when we lead people to the Lord around here, we say, listen, you're not committing yourselves to us as effort of community church. You're not committing yourself to me. I'm just simply giving you information, a little bit of a tour guide saying, here's Jesus. He's died for your sin. You commit to him. That's who you commit to. So it's a very individual decision that deserves to stand alone. But as soon as you decide that, you're actually immersed into the body of Christ. In other words, you become individually part of something so much bigger than who you are. 
So not only a congregation, but also a global movement, also like a time-wide movement all through history, the greatest movement the ever, world has ever seen. And you become part of that. You're baptized into the body of Christ. Then secondly, basically in response to that is, to the, is the baptism in water. And we can go to Romans chapter 6, uh, beginning of verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that Jesus was baptized into his death, and we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That word united means fellowship, participation, like we're, we actually do this with him. And so baptism in water is the most clear, like you see it set up right here in the front. And so it's immersion, of course, baptism, it's immersion into water. And so while that happens in a very natural way, something very significant supernaturally is going on. Like you're, you're, you're entering into a fellowship, you're entering into a relationship with the Lord that happens actually in baptism. Just like Ella said in her testimony, man, she got baptized and she said, man, I'm just a different person. Something happened in that moment. So it's not just about the water, it's done in obedience, but there's far more to it than that. Last Sunday, I was at Living Streams Church in Southampton, Pennsylvania, and you hear us talk about them, uh, you know, fairly often, and Pastor Vadim and <clears throat> some of the folks that we work with there in uh, uh, Southampton. So I was down there last weekend. Uh, the church has been around for a long time, but it kind of went through the doldrums, I guess you would say. <laughs> and over the course of the past year, year and a half, or even just longer than that, there's been a fresh work that's going on there through the leadership of Pastor Vadim. And so about nine months ago, nine, ten months ago, was the first time that we baptized anybody at Living Streams Church, like, I mean, it could be decade or could be an S on the end. I'm not quite sure. I just know that Pastor Vadim said, I'm not sure that the baptistry holds water. Like, we don't know what's been worn out. We don't know what gaskets have. I mean, it's been so long there's been water in that. I'm not sure what to expect. Let's fill it up and fix the stuff that needs to be fixed later. So about nine, ten months ago, we uh, baptized um, a couple of people. It was the first time <clears throat> this past Sunday. Uh, six. Six people were baptized this last Sunday. Yeah, that's wonderful. And uh, I'm pretty sure, by the way, I'm pretty sure that all of those who were baptized are actually here because they're uh, immigrants from Ukraine. All of them are here because of the war. And one of the ladies that got baptized, she came, her and her son came to the United States. She, you know, of course, they're making major adjustments, as you can possibly imagine. She thought it was important for her 18-year-old son to get connected with some other youth and young adults that are kind of going through the same thing. And so she hears about this meeting that happens at this church, and so she drops him off. Neither one of them have any church background whatsoever, have never been interested, just have no history at all. And so she's just looking for people that have been through the same thing. And so he starts going to this youth and young adult meetings on Friday night. She gets connected there as well, stays to visit with people, gives her life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and gets baptized last Sunday. What a, I mean, it's just, if you know, yeah, I think you all know me well enough to know that it's one of my favorite things to participate in. And then, of course, thirdly, then there's the baptism of fire, something that you don't hear about very often. But in Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 11, John the Baptist is is introducing Jesus Christ, and he says, you know, he's out baptizing, a baptism repents, baptizing people in the Jordan River. People are asking him the question, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I am not. There's one coming after me who's greater than I, the thongs of whose sandal I am unworthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so what is the baptism of fire? And it's that, it's that inner work. Fire consistently throughout Scripture speaks of a purifying, refining effect of the work that it, he does in our lives. And then finally, we come to this place here where there is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So going to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Now while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so again, baptism, like not just simply I have the Holy Spirit, but actually to be immersed in the very person of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I love about the activity of the Lord and one of the things I love about just the, the, uh, the way God works is that, of course, 
we know God as one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know God as one God, but yet he reveals himself and he works among us in three very distinct personas, or however you want to say that. And so all three are present throughout all of Scripture. But there seems to be those times when, like, one of them steps to the point. Like, so, you, so all the way back in the, the Old Testament, God is creator, father creator. And so he's creating, he's making a covenant. He's beginning to speak of the coming of the Messiah. Of course, in the Gospels, and Jesus steps to that place. It's almost like center stage. His redemptive work is there. And then we come to the book of Acts, and we see the Holy Spirit step to a place of maybe prominence or his activity, his work. And the Holy Spirit's been there all along. So all the way back in, the, in Genesis, verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters. Like he was there from the very beginning. You can go all the way back to the end, uh, Revelation 20, one of the last three verses. It simply says, the Spirit and the bride say come. The Holy Spirit's always there. But here we come in the book of Acts, and, and even Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit. He's going to come. And he seems to step to this, this place of prominence even as he's empowering and he's, he's building his church. And so we see Acts chapter 1, wait till you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of course, that this poured out in Acts chapter 2. We come to a place in Acts chapter 4 where uh, those people that did experience the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit experience another filling of the Holy Spirit. We come into Acts chapter 9 where... Uh, Saul, who would become known as the Apostle Paul, on the road to Damascus with letters to destroy the church there, he meets Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit gives this guy named Ananias the assignment of going and praying for Saul, who's going to become Paul, and he goes to him, lays his hands on him, and says that he's doing this so that he would receive his sight and he would be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. We can go all the way through a number of times in the book of Acts uh, Acts chapter 19 <clears throat> is one of those places they're going to Ephesus. And so there's a few believers that are there. And so when they enter the city of Ephesus, they've asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you received Jesus Christ? When you were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, did you receive or be baptized in the Holy Spirit? So we don't actually even know what you're talking about. Like we've never heard of this. So they explained that to them, laid hands on them, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. I the book of Acts is fantastic, by the way. I know every time I say that, stuff like that, I lose some credibility. <clears throat> because you might say, last week you said the Gospel of John's your favorite book. So, I, yeah, so it's all my favorite. It's all my favorite. It's all good. So just read it all. But one of the things I love about the book of Acts, that's the way I should say it. What I like about this, what I love about this, is just the exponential growth that is the book of Acts. So in the beginning of the book, of course, Peter preaches a message, there's 3,000 people get saved. And there's 5,000 people get saved. Then it's like, like daily they're adding to the number of those that are getting saved. And then verse, chapter 5, uh, Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, says, multitudes, I'm not even counting anymore. This is just so big, I can't even manage it. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I thought you'd be more excited about that. It's like, I'm just going to stop. I mean, Luke's a detailed person. He writes all the details. He says, no, I can't. I just can't handle. I just can't record all the stuff that God's doing. And then in Acts 19, this is why I'm mentioning this, you have all these miracles that are occurring through the book of Acts, and then he comes to Acts chapter 19, and Luke, recording this, said there were extraordinary miracles done at Ephesus. So my question is, aren't miracles by definition extraordinary? So what's the extra adjective going on here? So, so the... Uh, Luke is thinking, well, I used miracles to describe this, but now I've never seen something like this. And so now I need to add adjectives even to give it credibility. It's like the overuse of the word awesome. Like nothing's awesome because it gets used too much, right? Are you guys here? Are you with me? I thought that was actually kind of <laughs> true. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's the thing here, friends, we have to keep in mind that when John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness, people were coming out for a baptism of repentance. And in that setting, Jesus shows up on the scene. The Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3. The Gospel of Mark in Mark chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 3 of Luke as well. In those three settings, when John the Baptist said, see that guy, or I'm introducing, or I'm, I'm coming, he, bapti he, he, he introduced him as the one who would baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Isn't it just simply interesting 
that he didn't say, yeah, that's your redeemer. That's the one who's going to die for your sin. Now, the Gospel of John did that. Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not. He was initially introduced by the prophet as the one that would baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. And, man, we've got to make note of Jesus Christ as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Way back in April when I was introducing this series that we were going to enter into here with uh, the Holy Spirit, um, you know, we cycle through this teaching every, like, similar teaching every year. And uh, so I was going to introduce that, and I'm always looking for, like, hey, how new ways of communicating some things. And so I stood in front of you in April, and I simply said, hey, I'm really looking forward to this series that we have coming up because I'm going to introduce you to a very special friend of mine. And there's a reason why the lights are up in the room, and that's so I can see you. Because there is, like you may not know this, but there is an interaction between you and I, even here. And I can tell a little bit about what's happening in the room, and I can tell what captures your attention and what's, what you're ignoring and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, I stood here in front of you, and I said, I'm really looking forward to this upcoming series. I can introduce you to a friend of mine. And I thought you are looking like, who's that? Like, we have a guest coming? Who is it? Oh, it's not a guest. It's the Holy Spirit. He's here all the time. And I got you. Like, I baited you. Hook, you fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Like, every single one of them. I don't care what you, I saw it. I could see it from where I was standing. I'm introducing you to a friend. Now, I know that was kind of designed that way. Um, but it wasn't a joke. It's real. And uh, <clears throat> I would need to admit to you that it wasn't always that way for me. And I, I recognize, like, my experience in the church and in the body of Christ is not unfamiliar. I mean, it's similar than many of you that you kind of grow up in a system. And I don't say any of that to disrespect that. Like, that's, that's I'm, I'm grateful for my heritage, but it just wasn't where I was staying. You know what I mean? And so I, I was in a system and I was in a place. And for some of you, that may have been confirmation at a certain age. Okay, now's the time that you take the class. Now's the time that you confirm. Now's the time you do first communion, whatever that was. And and I was in a similar system in which certain expectations went along with certain ages. Fine. But my experience with the Lord predated that. Like, I, I knew the Lord before I was old enough, you know, according to some, to know the Lord. Which is fine. That's okay. And I came to that place where now it's okay. Now it's time for you to take the class. Now it's time for you to walk the aisle. Now it's time for you to get baptized and become part of the church. It was all kind of one package deal. And that's fine. But then... There wasn't much beyond that. There was good teaching. There was, there was some things about that. But pretty much like, okay, you've now secured your eternal destiny. Now just behave. Just behave. Just like work at it. Just manage your sinfulness. Like just, just do that. <clears throat> okay. I don't know anything different to do. And so that's exactly what I was trying to do. But I recognized that, man, there just wasn't power there to do that. So that was my context, and, and my context in that was very authentic, like I, I authentically wanted to follow the Lord. And then I see this other context in the body of Christ, and it's, it seems to be more excitable. It seems to be louder. It seems to be that preachers dress in white suits and comb their hair in some unusual ways or whatever that is. Like there's just, it just seems like there's, there's something, and you would, I would watch I mean, I watched some stuff on television, and I would wonder, like, is any of that real? Like, I, apparently some of it's real. Is all of that real? Am I missing something? And so there was something that was curious about the work of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit and all of the things that go along with that. There was a level of curiosity, but there was a cultural and even an intellectual barrier. Like, I didn't understand. And so if I didn't understand, I didn't feel like I could embrace and that plus, it was a whole different world than what I had ever lived in culturally. So is that just the way different people act? Or is that something that God is doing? And, and, and that was the limit. Like I just, I was curious, but didn't know fully how to embrace that. But my pursuit of the Lord was authentic. <clears throat> and so God, God can lead you when you're authentic, whether you understand what's going on or not. Like he can. He, and he does. And he was doing that in my life. And so as I was authentically pursuing the Lord, God began to open up some new things. And there was an activity in my life that now I could identify as the Holy Spirit. I couldn't identify it as that then. And it was confusing. And it was scary. And uh, it required a couple of things of me that I was not willing to do. It required of me that I would let go of some 
desire for intellectual understanding. Like there's, the Bible did tell us to be spirit-led, but we're oftentimes intellectually led, not spirit-led. Now, not, not, to dismount, not to discount the intellect, like we need to fully engage as well, but there's limits to what we can understand intellectually. And secondly, it required a level of surrender that I had not yet walked in, just release of myself before the Lord. And I would love to be able to stand before you and just simply say, and man, I just surrendered and embraced, and um, man, it's been wonderful since then. Of course, that would be a lie, and then it's not good to lie in church. Uh, so what actually happened, and uh, you know, I am the ultimate example of failure in so many ways. Um, I remember actually having a conversation with the Lord saying, you know, I don't understand all this stuff, and I don't understand what's working, what, what's going on, and I said, I actually don't want that. So I said, no, it was an active rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And it's almost, I mean, he didn't, I didn't hear him say this or anything like that, but it's almost as if he said, oh, fine, you want to do it by yourself, knock yourself out, go for it. You think you can do it? I'll, I'll step back. It's almost, like, it's almost like you just stepped back and said, hey, help yourself. Go for it. And I tried. And I'll tell you, the, the 18 months that, that post-dated that was some of the most difficult in my life. Um, I was spent emotionally. I was spent intellectually, my, even physically, and most importantly, spiritually. I had just run to the end of every source that I had and was completely lost. I don't think I was lost when it comes to my salvation, but I was actually in a place where I didn't know if I would walk away from Christ and his church. And I, I don't know, it, I could have, maybe even wanted to, but it's almost like what they say in John 6, like where else would I go? You have the words of life. Like that's the only thing that kept me. And I'm sure God kept me because he knew like this guy will figure it out eventually. He's a little slow, but he'll figure it out eventually. But it was in that place of just simply desperation, like, I, God, I can't, I can't do anymore without you. That I just submitted myself for someone to lay hands on me to receive the Holy Spirit. And I can simply tell you that, that in a moment, in a fraction of a second, life changed. Like, there's, I, I don't even know everything that changed. And, and to tell you the truth, like, I didn't know that thing changed in that moment. It was only as things played out over the course of even weeks, months, and even years that I could look back and say, okay, right there is a defining moment. I can't say that it was emotional. I can't say that it was like anything like that. It was just simply, it was a willingness to submit to the laying on of hands and receive the Holy Spirit. And the only thing, that, actually the very first thing that I noticed was the next morning when I got up and I uh, had my prayer time, uh, the prayer was empowered in a way that I had no comprehension. I, did, I thought, what in the world was that? It's actually what it felt like. And, um, and it just was enough to, to keep pursuing that, that work of the Holy Spirit. And I want that for you. And I want you to have the wind in your sails. And you might say, yeah, but you're a pastor. You have to get up there and preach. You've got to care for people through that stuff. And friends, maybe that's part of the problem, is that we limit the work of the Holy Spirit to what he happens within the context of the body of Christ. And maybe what we need to have is medical professionals with all of their training, which is wonderful stuff, empowered by the Holy Spirit with supernatural insight into how to care for each and every patient. Maybe we need school teachers that are supernaturally empowered with insight beyond their training, which is all good, but beyond that to be able to care for all of the 20 students that are sitting in their classroom. And we need business owners and parents and neighbors. And how about if we just simply, can we, can we surrender ourselves enough to say, hey, Holy Spirit, be released to do whatever you want, no boundaries in us, no boundaries around us, and let him have his way just like we sang in those songs. And can we just simply be in that place today? And I, three things here in your notes I just want to give you quickly as we think about uh, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First of all, we want to remove barriers. And so I shared some of mine. Like the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a different culture. I just couldn't figure it out. I just didn't. I just, it wasn't for me. Like it was something I pushed it away. Uh, for 2 Corinthians 10.5 uh, speaks of like those strongholds of the mind which just simply refer to the things that we think, the ways that we think 
that are inconsistent with the word. So we might think it's weird. I got to be Pentecostal, you know, by definition, culturally. You got to wear flashy suits. You got to buy an airplane to fly around. Like all that kind of stuff that's so oftentimes associated with like the extreme Pentecostal. And you might think, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, then let's, you don't have to, okay? Like don't let the culture be a stumbling block to receiving the Holy Spirit. And you got to sort some of those things through before, like even maybe the intellect. Secondly, ask. See, the person of, the, of Jesus Christ has provided all of this for you. Uh, Luke chapter 11, Jesus is teaching about prayer. And he, the, prayer of the, the, the Lord's Prayer, two parables on prayer. And then he simply says something like this. Hey, you, being a father, if your children ask you for uh, something good, are you going to give them a counterfeit or something that's actually going to be harmful? No, you, of course you would not. Then he says, you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How many of you, uh, your heaven, how much more your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So you might think, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. Can I just tell you, all of that's true, none of it matters. It's not about you. It's about him, he's good. Ask. And then thirdly, just rest, receive. Like, don't, don't complicate this. Well, I didn't feel goosebumps. I didn't, you know, fall over. I didn't speak in tongues. Like, can we just, like, postpone all of that? Just let it go. And just, re- just rest and receive. And so you may, you may have someone lay hands on you and pray to receive the Holy Spirit and feel nothing. It's not about what you feel. It's about what is true. And what is true is that heaven, our Heavenly Father gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And you can just rest in that. And over the course of the next days, weeks, months, who knows when. Man, you just, may, you just may sense this rush of the Holy Spirit, and you know, like a fresh wind in your sails, and you know that you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, beginning. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation. So he's talking about foundational parts of the Christian life. And he says, he mentions these. Repentance, faith towards God, instructions about baptisms, which is interesting that it's plural, the laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. I want to point out one of those. One of those is the laying on of hands, or in the original language it speaks about impartation. So repeatedly through the book of Acts you say they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And so you might think, well, can I just ask God? Um, Yeah, you can. But why ignore, like why have that be an intellectual block to say, I don't need anybody to lay hands on me. Well, I don't know. You need to back that up by scripture and just allow someone to lay hands on you. And so let me tell you how we're going to be closing our service today. I'm going to ask uh, Mark and the worship team to come out. I'm going to ask our prayer ministry teams to come to the front and stand. And this is what we're going to do. If you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you to come to the front. And you're not even going to need to hear what people pray for you. We don't need to hear prayer requests from you. It's going to be as simple as this. We're going to lay hands on you just simply because Scripture says so. We're going to lay hands on you and we're going to say receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You may or may not feel a thing. It makes no difference whatsoever. You can allow us to touch you and pray God's blessing of the Holy Spirit upon you. You can turn around and walk away. It takes like three seconds. But my confidence is not like in us praying for you. Our confidence is not in whether you feel something or not. Our confidence is in what the Word says and what it has for us. And He simply says, ask. And that's what we're going to do. So I'm asking you to stand to your feet. And we're just going to go into a time of worship. And as we do that, if you just want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just come. Just give us, give us three seconds to lay hands on you and say, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And let's watch what God does, not just simply in this moment, but far beyond this as well. And I'm going to pray for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. And then we're going to release you to come and receive prayer. So let me pray for you. This is what that verse says. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ abound to you. Jesus Christ and His grace, His redemptive work qualifies us for everything that you have for us. It's not about what we deserve, not about whether we've earned, not, it's just none of that. It is, we cooperate with you 
to receive everything that your abundant grace has provided for us. We receive the love of the Father. We break off condemnation in this place to think I can't come to you. Lord, you are a you are good, good Father, and we can enter into that place. And then the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the koinonia, the, the unity, the, the work of the Holy Spirit that's close and personal, not just something that we experience when we're together, but we can live with that consistent work of the Holy Spirit. And I bless you with that. Come and receive prayer. For those of you who are watching online, I'm just going to jump in here for a second Second, while the ministry is happening in the room, and we want to take some time to pray for you. Um, so wherever you're at, um, whatever posture you're willing to take to receive as we bless you with the work of the Holy Spirit, whether you're the type to put your hands out, put your hand on your heart, put it into the air, we want to bless you. We believe that the Holy Spirit can work even across airwaves, right? And by you putting your hand out on your heart, raising it, it's your way of submitting and saying, lay hands on me. Come and do what you want to do. So if you're available at this moment, I want to now bless you. I bless you with an increase of the Holy Spirit in your life and in your being. I bless you with the peace that comes from the Holy Spirit. I bless you with the gift of wisdom like you've never had before that comes from the Holy Spirit. I bless you with an increase in the ability to hear his voice. In the name of Jesus. And we pray that he takes up more and more space in you. That he becomes the loudest voice in your head and in your spirit. We bless you with that. And so in the name of Jesus, and as a community, we extend to you more of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So even now, we encourage you that the Spirit speaks peace to you, empowerment to you, the miraculous in you, and we bless you.
our service. The team's going to stay up here and continue to pray. And I even recognize that as our service closes, there will be others that will, that will want to respond later. So I just want to let you know that the team is going to remain here for a number of minutes, just continuing to bless those who are looking for more of the Holy Spirit, looking to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to move along with the conclusion of our meeting without highlighting what Ella shared with us in her testimony when she said, I have been reborn. So there is more for us in the Holy Spirit, but there is also that invitation for each and every one of us to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be reborn, which is a simple agreement with who the Lord is as creator, our heavenly father, agreement with who we are as designed in his image, but gone our own way and, and sinned and rebelled and walked our own path, agreement with who Jesus is, which is the only son of God who lives a perfect sinless life and exchanged that life, his life for our life, and then agreement to follow after Jesus and to elevate him to that place of lordship. And I want for people who can hear me to know that there's an invitation this weekend to be reborn and to follow after Jesus. So if that's you, I'd encourage you not to leave this place without coming and allowing one of the prayer team to pray with you as you make this series of agreement statements. I have a couple words of knowledge. And again, our prayer team will be here to minister. But we believe that there's someone here with a spinal deformity, scoliosis, um, and that we would like to pray for you. We also believe that God is releasing the gift of tongues, specifically through worship. And if that's been a gift of the Holy Spirit that you don't regularly operate in, but you would like to, we just want to bless you and release that gift, even as you enter into worship, maybe even later this week or later today, just to begin to ask the Lord for a, the gift of tongues operating in your life. We also feel like the Lord was speaking to someone about God's authority and you've been wrestling with or trying to work through issues, maybe in your own strength. And the encouragement is for you to submit those things to the authority of the Lord Jesus. As we close, I just want to bless you to receive the baptism, the immersion fully into the Holy Spirit of God in every area of your life. Be blessed. Don't feel, for, don't feel the need to run off, but be blessed in Jesus' name. And we'll see you next week.